Hey, everybody, it's Sherry again. We are here at The Writing Glitch. I am an occupational therapy therapist. Yeah, I got it. I'm an occupational therapist and a recovering dysgraphic. Uh, it's great to have you here today um, here at The Writing Glitch. Hacking dysgraphia, no pencil required. I've always struggled with, with some reading to some degree, and over the weekend, I was out at the International Dyslexia Association conference, and I learned where my difficulty is, is the reading comprehension, and they call that hyperlexia. So I have a name that goes now with where my reading challenges are, which is really cool for, for me. And now I have to really take a look at that and really understand it. So over the next couple of months, maybe you're going to hear more about that. And I've all also always struggled with writing. And it only it was about 10 years ago now that I just challenged myself to conquer that fear of writing and conquer public speaking. So here I am creating a podcast and writing books. Today I am with a mom of some kids with some with disabilities, ADHD and autism. She has ADHD herself. She has a very interesting path, a path here when I look at her bio. And my heart goes out to her. We're recording this right in the middle at the beginning of the Israeli Hamas war. And so as I was reading her bio today, my heart just went out. So let me read her bio to you and let me welcome Hillary Glasser to the interview today. Hillary is a native of Metro Detroit. She is an, has an unusual career path. She got her start as a hairstylist and makeup artist. I have a thought about that as well. <laughs> Learning to make herself, market herself to others when her Polish grandmother begged her to return to school and learn computers, she did. Hillary learned to code and realized how much she hated it, but haphazardly found herself learning SEO processes and stuck with it for the last 20 years. After moving to Israel to attend college, one the one and only job she could get as a marketing was was a marketing director for a startup e-commerce company. Post graduation, Hillary continued to work in marketing and founded a unique challenge when she made her way statewide working for an, an advertising agency. When she is not working, she's hanging out with her two sons, her husband, and the zoo. Hmm, the zoo. Oh, her multiple dogs and frogs. She spends time volunteering with the PTA. Good job, girl. And for her local soccer organization, Hillary Glasser, welcome to the podcast. And as again, my heart is just going out to you um, with somebody who has their heart in Israel and yet here at home in the States as well. So I, I just want to just take a moment just to honor before we get started. Have a moment of silence. And I know that this won't come out until a little while from now, but I just felt I needed to, to do that. And it probably wasn't long enough, but life happens, right? So Hillary, you are the owner of Ellie and Jojo Communications, which is a digital marketing firm, but you reached out to me to talk a little bit about dysgraphia. So tell me more. Sure. Um, so I grew up uh, here in Metro Detroit. And by the time I got to the point where I could create my own business and um, have the tool set in front of me to do that, um, and I'm looking at names and everything for my business, I realized that 
anything glazer related, like my last name just does not bode very well for my business. But I also wanted to give a nod to my mom and my stepmom. Um, you know, on my website, it talks about how they were the Google before they were Google. But essentially, my mom and my stepmom had this massive part of my learning process. Um, having ADHD um, for many years undiagnosed, especially during school, was not easy. Um, I had a hard time reading. Hyperlexia is something that um, definitely rings a bell for me. It's very difficult. Um, you know, letters and everything are not, they're not always uh, put together very nicely for me. It makes it difficult to read. Um, and I look at my two kids who, you know, during the pandemic, uh, one of them was in first grade when the pandemic started. And that is like the most vital time for your kids to learn handwriting skills. And the other one was in second grade. So neither of them have great handwriting, but um, along with autism comes a hefty dose of dysgraphia where it can be very difficult to understand what he's writing. And I look back at the way my mom and my stepmom were so patient with me and how I learned with ADHD and how hard it was for me to um, not so much to get up and, and do public speaking. I think I'm, I've mastered this ability to do things on the fly, but when it's written in front of me, that's a lot harder. And they were always so patient with me. So I try to bring that, you know, forward in how I work with my kids, but also how I work with my business, because I know that not everybody has the same level set and skill set that I have when it comes to doing any digital marketing things. So for me, dysgraphia, you know, it it really works hand in hand. It's like um oh what's the there's a word for it, um, where something is like coexisting with another thing. They call it a comorbidity, but that's not the for me, I feel like that's a, the wrong term for this, but it does go hand in hand with so many different neurodivergent um issues. So it was really interesting for me to like to find you and to, you know, be able to talk about these things because not only do I see it with my own kids. But working within PTA, PTSA, um, I've almost made it my mission within our school district to make sure that as we are, you know, giving lots of different kids kudos in our district, we have this like all-star thing that they do on Facebook, um, that we're not forgetting about the kids who are struggling and maybe aren't so open and outwardly helping their um, their classmates or their teacher because they're they're stuck in this space of I'm struggling to figure out how this thing works. So it was it was kind of cool to find you and your whole organization. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. So right now, tell me a little bit about that first grader. You say he's still struggling with the writing process. What are your teachers doing or how are you supporting them in the school? to get the homework done, get what worksheets completed? How are you opening the door there to get the message through? So my then first grader is now in fifth grade and his handwriting has not improved. Um, but after speaking with, um, in our school, we have three different fifth grade teachers that all rotate in for different subjects. Um, last year, one of the fifth grade teachers was a fourth grade teacher. And she said to me, you will not believe how awful some of these kids, like their handwriting is. I said, oh, I would absolutely believe it. I mean, these are pandemic babies. Of course I believe it. Um, and she devised a plan to help the entire fourth grade work on their penmanship and really like take things back to basics into kindergarten, first grade, helping them understand that, you know, by fourth grade, you're working on regular lined paper, but the fundamentals that you knew in first grade are still applied, that your letters shouldn't be three lines large, that, you know, your lowercase letters should be um, almost like half the size of your uppercase letters. And she did a fantastic job. And then I look at my, my youngest, who is the one with ADHD. And yesterday, actually this morning, he presented me with this... Um, application. It was an application to join student council, to run for student council, which was huge. So exciting for him to even consider that. He is um, he is an overachiever. 
He's a, I love him to pieces. He is, um, he reminds me a lot of my dad, but he was so excited that um, he said, well, I want to run for vice president. I said, why not president? He said, oh, it's such a popularity contest. You only get, you know, two kids from each class that can really run. So I just, I want to be VP. And I said, okay, more power to you. Um, you don't have to follow my footsteps and be the president of everything. And um, maybe I'm an overachiever too. But he showed me his um, his application and I looked at it and I said, I don't think I need reading glasses yet, but it's very hard for me to read this. And he said, "Is did I write too light? And I said, no, I know you're working on your, your penmanship and not writing really, really hard. Um, but it's hard to make out the individual letters. So maybe let's let's try word by word on you know how we can rewrite some of this so that it's legible. And he said, "Well, I don't, I don't think we need to do that because I'm not really turning it in. Like I am turning it in, but I have to read from it, and it's okay if I know what it says." And mm-hmm. I said, "Cool, but in order for you to be able to read what it says, you have to turn the application in, which means your teachers have to read what it says too." And um, we spent maybe 10 minutes really going through and identifying which letters were the ones that were really hard to see. Um, with my oldest, who's in sixth grade, you know, he's he's on the spectrum. So any type of change from fifth to sixth grade is really difficult. Um, but this kid has really done his due diligence in trying to make it work. And there are times where, you know, I've heard from various teachers that it can be really hard to understand what it is he's writing. And I get it because some letters are big, some letters are really small, almost nothing is spelled correctly. And uh, I started working actually with his science teacher on ways to not just like improve his handwriting, but also do things in a way that help his science teacher understand what he's writing. Um, They use Google Classroom. And at the beginning of each, I want to say like each semester, the kids get this uh, science, we call it a notebook. It's not really a notebook, it's a packet of papers. But it's a guide that the kids create as like a study guide to help them study throughout the semester. And before each test, they're meant to go through all of their definitions, they're meant to write things out, they have to take pictures of it, submit it to Google Classroom. And I asked his teacher, can we use Cami? And Cami is this great add-on for PDFs within Google Classroom. So it opens up into a Google Doc and then you can, or it opens up into like a the PDF viewer and then you can open it in Cami. And then you can start to type out what you need to. So for his definitions, um, he can actually type out what his definitions are. And to help him through some of his thought process, there's an additional add-on for Chrome um, that allows him to do voice to text. So then he can review what it is he is reading or what he tried to type out. Um, And if it doesn't read very well to him, then he can go in and individually fix letters and spellings. So let me make sure I am I'm understanding the software. It's Cami, Mm -hmm. K-A-M-I. Yep. So for people who would like to learn more about Cami, is it Cami.com? Oh, um. I don't know, but I can look that up. Um, all I know is it's something within the um, Chrome extension store. It, oh, okay, it's a Chrome extension. Okay. We'll see what we can find and put make sure that that gets in the show notes. Um, it's a really cool software that his resource room teacher utilized during the pandemic. And we continue to utilize it now just to help... Um, make things a little bit easier for him. So he still has to write in the physical notebook when he's in class. But when we come home or when he comes home and he we're studying together, he has a um, a whole exam on Friday about this last grouping of lessons. So what we do is we then go into Cami and we refill things out um, just within the, the notebook itself, just so that it gives him something to study off of that's clean. And also gives him something to submit to his teacher when it's classwork that his teacher can actually read. So while we work on um, all of the occupational therapy side of things with, you know, making sure he's not pressing too hard, um, helping him understand the the flow of letters and the way the way things should be shaped and formed, 
he also has this other option that um, reinforces what he's learning and also makes it easier for everybody else to understand. I love that. You're still reinforcing handwriting, but you have found Mm -hmm. assistive technology to help support him. And that's the way it should be. So anybody has not heard this from me before, people will often ask me, when do I stop teaching kids their handwriting skills and move on to keyboarding? I say, don't ever stop practicing handwriting because it's a life skill. It's something that you never know when we're going to need it. Who knows when they're going to take out all the satellites and all of a sudden the internet's going to be gone. And Mm -hmm. so... We need to be able to communicate. So looking at practicing handwriting from that perspective, but uh, also utilizing the assistive technologies that are out there. Thank you for sharing a new one with me. I I Mm -hmm. personally uh, have Grammarly attached to my Google Drive. So I wish it was in spreadsheet though. It doesn't work on Google on Google Sheets. Oh yeah, on Google Sheets, um, it doesn't work as much or work as well. Um, yeah, I wish it would though. Yeah, I haven't figured out what to to do there, but it works well in Google Docs and it works in in uh, slides, but it also works in Word, and it works when I'm in Canva, and it works like all those other mm-hmm. places that I travel on the internet. Um, So I utilize Grammarly a lot. Would Grammarly alongside Cami be a good combination? I think with the way my son learns, probably not. It would, it might be too much for him, but it can be a powerful combination for somebody with really good executive functioning skills. There are times where um, I love Grammarly. I use it religiously for pretty much everything, even when I'm putting together websites. But there are times where it's also intrusive and won't go away. (laughs) Where I'm trying to write something and it's blocking some of the words and that becomes um, just very intrusive to me. So I see it with him too, but... Yeah, sometimes the predictive speech on my phone is really annoying from the grammar line. Uh Very much so. I can see that too. Um, but yeah. I think it can be a very powerful combination for somebody. Yeah. Now, and then the thing that I utilize a lot is Otter AI. Mm-hmm. Um, creating transcripts. Like as soon as we're done with this conversation, I upload the audio file into Otter AI and I get a transcript of this conversation so that I can add that onto the podcast. I'm also using Otter AI a lot, and I have now added Chat GPT. What what um, AI products are you incorporating into your son's um, re- regimen? Uh, regimen is that the right word? Regimen, of, yeah. uh, of uh, uh, technologies that he's able to access on a continuous basis, in addition to Cami. So he does not get access to AI products just yet. Um, I love ChatGPT. My husband and I talk about this all the time because um, it can be so helpful in trying to just get ideas started. Uh, But at the level of my son's learning for either of them right now, um, I worry that the use of ChatGPT will kind of take over their creative thought process. And the older they get, the less likely they are to actually write things on their own. Um, I see it a lot in high schools now too, where it's a common theme where teachers will get an essay and they'll say, wow, this sounds not at all like you. This is zero personality. You could be creating an essay and it should still have some personality in it. And they know immediately that this was chat GPT. Um, There are great tools out there just to help get ideas sparking. Um, but for for students in particular, I feel like chat GPT is not, not a great tool for them. Um, and I want my kids to kind of understand that there's um, there are some great usages for AI, 
but they still need to put in all of that hard work first before they can get access to some of that stuff. They're still pretty, in my eyes, they're still pretty young and their learning levels are still um, not quite there. But uh, there is another good tool that's on Chrome that we do utilize for my oldest that allows, um, it's not really considered an AI tool, but it's a um, almost like a read-along where it's like older, it's older technology, but if he's struggling with reading something on a page, especially for something like science, where you get a lot of fancy words, um, the page will be read by a bot and he can change the the accent of it, which cracks me up because there are times he changes it to like Australian. And, um, and you know, then I hear him giggle and I'm like, what did you do? Oh, I just changed the bot's the accent to Australian. And now it kind of sounds like dad. Uh, my husband is South African. so <laughs> But it okay. allows him to understand how a word is, is supposed to sound. Um, he went through a whole unit where he had to learn about precipitation, transpiration, evaporation. And when I spoke to his science teacher, um, I said, every time he says transpiration, it comes out transportation. And his science teacher laughed and said, that is him and every other student that I have. They cannot say transpiration. But we turned that tool on and he started saying transpiration without any issues. It was like he could hear the tool and then go back and listen to it again. And so the auditory processing. Yeah, the mm-hmm. auditory processing was working. Is that Speechify by any chance? I don't think so. You know, I will find out the name of it. Um, I would have to go into his Google Classroom to remember what it is. Um, because I use, it, speech, I use Speechify if I'm trying to read a Google Doc that's rather long. Um, I actually was using it. I, I don't know. Did I tell you that I am in the process of publishing another book? So I actually turned on Speechify to mm-hmm. read the book to me so that I, and I was closing my eyes and not reading it so that I could catch errors. Mm-hmm. Um, so he uses it, snap, snap and read. Snap and read. Mm-hmm. So Cami and snap and read. Have you ever heard of snap type? I have not. I'm going to have to write that one down. So snap type is looks at your worksheets and helps you fill in the blank. Like if you have a fill in the blank kind of worksheet, it will help you fill in the blank. I must confess, I have not used it. Um, But I know a lot of OTs recommend it for kids that are struggling, especially like with science terms and things like that. Another tool that you may want to consider is called co-writer where it Mm -hmm. helps with some of the predictive uh, uh, speech, uh, speech writing tools. Um, And I don't know how different that would be from Cami for you, but that's another one. And I know that there's a Chrome extension for that one. So a lot of, um, because they use Google Classroom, a lot of the Chrome extensions have to be like okayed through our district. Um, But these are great extensions that I can now go back to the IT team and say, hey, as your PTSA council president, I have a couple of recommendations for things that might help other students. I know that co-writer is approved in many school districts. So they may even know. I have to look into it. Yeah. I will definitely have to look into it. So getting back to your business, Mm -hmm. how has helping your kids and your business, like how have they influenced one another? So understanding how my children use the internet has been a, like a great driving force in my business because they are the next generation of search users. Um, you know, SEO has evolved in so many ways since I started practicing this over 20 years ago. And there are times where, you know, we got the Google Home many years ago when it first came out. And I have a great picture of my kids holding the original Google Home in their hands and asking Google questions as it lights up. And and even now, the way that they ask questions 
is so different from how I ask questions to Google. Um, they they will ask these very, very long-winded questions and somehow Google understands them. I ask shorter questions. I ask things that are more succinct. Um, I also have the um, the Google AI, the like experimental AI in the, my search engine, and they're not allowed to have it because, um, and now I just heard my Google Home answer me. Um, <laughs> I triggered it somehow, but they're not allowed to have it because um, I want them to learn how to do research. So a lot of times we're getting, we're, I guess we're getting into this age where um, kids are not understanding how to do research from books. They're believing everything they see on the internet. And I work with a lot of mental health professionals to build their sites, make them more accessible, make them more functional. Um, instead of these long pages of just blocks of copy, being able to break it up so that the user experience is a better flow and has more of a story. And my kids really influence that because they they have the shortest attention span of any generation because they're kids. And if it doesn't look right to them, if it doesn't help them answer questions, then I have not done my job. Um, being able to make a web page easier for a screen reader to read is also something that you know my kids have been a driving force on because they use all these tools to help them read pages. So if it can't read a page properly for my kids, how is it going to read a page properly for anybody else with a disability or any other ability that, you know, where they lack the ability to read a page on their own. So they've been a pretty big driving force in that. So do you embed that, that thing onto your websites that you create that if you turn it on, it'll read the page for you? No, there are a lot of different um, like Chrome applications for that Chrome extensions. What I do is I make sure that my any site that I work on is accessible um, under like the ADA. Uh, a lot of lawsuits have been like, I think the ADA lawsuits have skyrocketed just when it comes to websites because websites are not ADA compliant and people forgot about web accessibility. I will thank former President Obama for that. Um, so I make sure that every site that I work on meets the criteria for ADA accessibility. And because I have kids that have issues reading, um, that have issues understanding text, I go that extra mile that when I get a report back saying, hey, this page is not, it, it's accessible, but not as accessible as it can be, then I go back and I update it so that it can be more accessible. It can, it can be easier for somebody to understand. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to go and be a little bit vulnerable. When you look at my homepage, I am bet you it's not accessible. Probably not. Um, there are definitely ways to make it more accessible and more user-friendly. We get into this, this paradigm, this, uh, this weird conundrum of how do we appease the Google gods but also make it easier for people to, to digest? How do we make things more accessible? And you get different schools of thought. Some people say you can't. But if you're making a web page or a website accessible for a human being, you will make the Google gods happy. I have watched that in my own practices because they all of these Google search spiders, they want to be able to understand a page in the same way that a human does. They're never going to be able to because they're a bot. But if you make it accessible, you're not going to harm that experience for a search bot. You're just going to make that overall experience for a human much better. And we have to create web pages for people, not for bots. Hmm. Do you have recommendations on fonts and font size? Um, I am of the firm belief that your font size should be at the bare minimum 16 points, um, usually a little bit bigger. Not everybody likes it. Some people think that that's, you know, like, oh, 16 is, is good enough, but not everybody can see that well. And utilizing things like bold, italics, underlines can do more than I think people give it credit for. Um, you know, when you bold a word, it stands out. When you make something underlined, 
it adds emphasis. You italicize something, it looks more important. All of those old school tricks from, you know, when we first started using Word and the paperclip popped up, they still work and they still work for even web accessibility. Um, I like to have my websites have um, at the very least a 17 point font. Not every font works well. Um, I don't love the font for Arial. I think it's very hard. Uh, I had one client who loved using this very flowy cursive script. Um, I think it was called Pacific. And man, was that hard to read. It was mm -hmm. hard for like my eyes to read it. And I grew up with grandparents who all spelled, you know, wrote in cursive. Um, if I can't read that, then it's going to be harder for other people to read it. So choosing the right font to go with your brand is really important. Uh, I think I use a, a mix of Avenir on my own site. And even then, Avenir can be very, very, very tiny. And I don't like that it's so tiny. But then if you make it too big, it's also not great. Um, I'm working on a site right now that uses, I'm probably going to butcher the name, but Josephin. Um, and I love it. I love the way that it looks. I love how crisp and clean it is. Um, and it's used in conjunction with um, another font that's a, just a little bit more staunch and sturdy and um, classic looking. Whereas Josephine looks a little bit more updated. So it's a nice balance. Hmm. So one of the things that I teach when I am doing workshops with teachers is that kids who are struggling with reading are also typically struggling with writing. And the open source dyslexic font is great to help kids learn mm -hmm. how to read but we need to convert that font into another font before they try to practice and copying from it because all kids want to do is color because they color in the bottom of that font. And I have been looking for a, a really good font that is a crisp, clean handwriting based mm -hmm. font. And what I have found is obviously Arial is not the font. And that's what most, the Arial and Times Roman are what most type books and, and typeset is, is written in. And so when I went looking, when I first was looking, I was looking at Microsoft. The only font that I could find was Century Gothic. So the A looks like a printed A. The G looks like the circle with the hook. Um, and, but the capital I still was a straight line. So kids were confusing the capital letter I with the lowercase L. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I continued to look. Google has two that, that I'm, I'm okay with. One's a little bit bolder and one's a little bit lighter. Um, Poppins and quicksand. But uh -huh. the one that I found that is most the way we handwrite that still looks like it's typeset. Like I, yes, there are handwriting fonts out there that look like you hand wrote them, but the one that is still looks like typeset that's most the like we handwrite is Lexend, and you have to install it on all computers. And Lexend has yeah. six or seven different styles. Now I believe that my son has converted. It's either still Poppins or it's Lexend, and so it's one of the two or, or a combination of both on my website. So I don't know, you'd have to look at it to double check. And I'm sure you would be able to look in that back end to figure that out. But that is why I do that is so that I can have people that are more of struggling writers to be able to see it. And I use it as a tool for education. Um, and my book, Handwriting Brain Body Disconnect, I made them do it in Poppins. Have you looked at Deco? D E K K O? D E K K O. No, but I will. Um, it may have, it may go by some other names. I love Poppins. I have a client that uses Poppins on her site, and it is probably one of my favorites because it's the most versatile. Um, but Deco 
it looks a lot, it, it looks typeset, but it's something that kids can use and even adults can use to model their handwriting after because it still gives that handwriting feel. I see that. It's okay. Um, let me, um, I'm going to type the entire alphabet in front of, so I can see it all. Mm-hmm. And then hit, hit enter, hit enter. Oh, there it is. Um, so I am going to, where is it? I'm going to share my screen so that those of you who um, watch this on YouTube can see this is what Deco looks like in lowercase. So we still have the queue that doesn't have the flag. Um mm -hmm. Which is so, funny because that's how that's how I write my cues. I don't write it with the flag. I just mm -hmm. I write it like it's a backwards P. And that's how I write my G's too, my capital G's. I can't obviously put things in the right order, but that's okay. So then looking at the capitals, the I is crossed. Nice. So that's close too. I didn't, um, mm -hmm. thank you for that. Um, so people, people that are out there, uh, that are looking at this, the YouTube uh, version, you can see that in front of you, pretty much the letters are, are there. So that's another resource other than Lexend that you can use. So thank I love you. Lexend though. I, um, our, middle school PTSA website, I changed all of the font to Lexend because I did not like the original font. It looked very outdated. And I feel like Lexend is, it's a bit more modern and it looks more personable. Okay. Yeah, I don't know I what like. it is that I like about it. Sometimes I do like it on my Canva stuff. And then other times I flip back to Poppins. But I think it might, it might, it might depend on what you're putting out whether it's, you know, something social, there are times where um, I will openly tell brands that like, yes, this is the font that you've chosen for your brand. But if it doesn't fit the image that you're trying to put out on social, it's okay to use a different font. Um, mm -hmm. Like Halloween, uh, no one should be using their regular font for a Halloween image or a Halloween social post because it doesn't look spooky enough unless your font is a very spooky font, like your spirit Halloween or something. Yeah, but I'm not probably not going to be doing too much in the Halloween spooky things either. So, but <laughs> but it, but that's but the same concept applies where if the font itself doesn't fit the overall feel and theme of the image you're trying to put out, then it's okay to change the font. You know, it mm -hmm. should match that vibe. I understand. I understand. So, when you're helping kids or getting helping the IT team mm -hmm. with a child's Chromebook, do you recommend that Lexend be the font of choice on their their book, uh, their Chromebook, or uh, or or don't you get into that kind of uh, level of connection with your school? I haven't gotten into that level of connection just yet, um, but I do think there are ways for students to actually change the way the font looks within their own Chromebook. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I want to say our district is okay with kids changing that font. Um, I did teach my son how to change the font within any Google Doc that he has um, because he got tired of like Arial being the default font. So... I started teaching him how to change all of that stuff. And he said, I had no idea this was all customizable. I said, well, just like you're an individual, your stuff should be individualized too. Which is where we are going in the 21st century is individualized education. And mm -hmm. I was at the 
a dyslexia rally in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania this morning. And that was one of the comments from one of the speakers is, we are in the era of individualized education for all students, not just kids with mm-hmm. on IEPs. So um, I love that you said that at the very beginning um, of our school year, so actually in the summer before the school year started, our PTSA council has a president's and principal's breakfast. And as the president, I got to give this big speech. And one of the things I mentioned was how grateful I was in the 90s for having incredible teachers that recognized that I wasn't learning in traditional ways. And they changed their approaches without being prompted by any of my parents, um, who wouldn't have prompted that anyway. But um, they changed some of their approaches just to help me understand everything I was learning. Um, back when I was in high school, I took two independent studies because I couldn't really do acting. Um, I took an acting class in high school and I was told I was too good by the teacher. So I had to find something else because he couldn't move me from the basic level to the next class without passing the class. And he said, you're making other kids feel bad. And I said, huh, okay, well, can I do something else? And he, you know, they spoke to my counselors about it and I got to learn about the Vietnam War, uh, which was really cool. I had a really awesome teacher who fought and served in the Vietnam War. And it was like having a personal guide. As I had questions, he could answer them in real time and tell me like, it wasn't entirely like what this book is saying. It was a little bit more like this. Or, hey, don't believe what you read in this magazine. That's a bit sensationalized. It was more like this. But then I see, you know, both of my kids have had IEPs. My oldest still has an IEP. My youngest does not. Um, IEPs are meant to serve academic purposes, not necessarily serve the student. Um, And I feel like a, a lot of parents don't know how to make that distinction. So if I tell a parent, Um, yeah, my son has an IEP, they immediately think, oh, well, he's just skating by. No, it's meant to help him create goals for academics, but it doesn't necessarily serve him in some of the areas that I know he still needs help in. I loved that I got to have a two-hour long conversation with his science teacher about how to work with him and how to help him because he was already doing that in his class. And he said, I know your son is the type of kid where he, if he can draw what he thinks we're talking about, he's still listening. He's still actively listening, but he's not looking at me the whole time. And they said, and one kid called him out and said, well, how come, how come he gets to draw? Well, because I know if I ask him a question, he's going to answer without a problem. And I said, have you tested that theory? He said many times and it has worked. Your son listens. He gets it. He's understanding those concepts. All I have to do is just let him draw, let him draw whatever he wants. And I, I said to him, thank you for giving him that freedom to do whatever it is he needs to be doing in that moment while still actively listening. Because I have a friend who, while in med school, part of how he learned to study in med school was to draw things out. He would draw out the organs and then, you know, make labels everywhere. And we're really watching education, when it's done right with a very supportive district, we're in a very supportive district. I love our school district. Um, But when it's done right in a supportive district, you end up with really amazing educators who don't just teach. They really educate and they allow students to learn in more than one way. They allow them to learn in a way that makes sense for them without needing that IEP. And I I love being like, you know, bearing witness to it because it's so different from when I was in school. I pause. I'm trying to figure out how to say this without sounding uh, uh, negative to the other school district, but that's a gift. Oh, I know. Um, oh, when I um, when I had to present, uh, my son had a developmental pediatrician, and I had to bring his IEP with me to almost every appointment. She had a couple of students with her one day, and she said. I just want you guys to see that this this is an IEP that's well-written. I don't see this very often. And I looked at her, I said, thank you. I will tell his resource room teacher, not that she will care, but that she writes a very well-written IEP. And 
a lot of that really comes down to what is your district doing to support those educators so that they can support their students? And I realize that, you know, the district that I'm in, I, I am truly blessed to be in the district that we're in because I don't have to worry as much. Um, I don't have to fight as hard. I still have to fight. When you've got kids with disabilities, you still have to fight no matter what. But that's true for all kids. You're still going to have to fight for your kids to get the education you think they deserve. But I like that I don't have to fight as hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, well, we need to come to a close. I think that you and I could just sit here <laughs> and talk for hours, but we do need to come to a close because I'm sure that the listeners are going to go, okay, Sherry, it, I'm almost at school already. Uh, but is there, I, I noticed when you were sending me the documents ahead of time that you were offering a free audit for websites. And mm -hmm. tell my audience what that's all about. So within your audience, there are likely some people who own their own businesses or they run organizations. Um, a lot of them, um, I work with a lot of different organizations and smaller businesses that will come to me and say, what is wrong with my site? I'm not ranking. When the question should really be, what's wrong with my site? People aren't seeing it. They're not seeing it because it's not user-friendly. It's not that it's not ranking. It's just they're not seeing it because it's not user-friendly. A lot of that has to do with keywords, but I like to um, really take a hard look at what's going on on a website. Is it accessible? Is there something going on with it where um, maybe it's too new and Google just doesn't know that it's even there yet? Um, or maybe it's that um, it's not user-friendly, so it's not going to adhere to SEO best practices. Um, so then it's not going to get ranked and nobody can find it. But a lot of times when I offer like a free SEO audit, it's just to give an organization or a small business a leg up so that, you know, they don't have to feel like they're competing as hard against some of the bigger websites, some of the bigger organizations out there that can hire a million dollar team to build a website for them. So I like to offer it as a way to just make things better. <laughs> I might have to well, take on that. <laughs> anytime. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. And if you head over to sherrydotter.com and you're scrolling around on the homepage and you kind of go off of it, there's a pop-up that comes up. I just put up this weekend a brand new teacher checklist. And on that teacher checklist is some things that you can ask the kids about handwriting some about keyboarding, and then we, you talk about some things about behavior that might impact their ability to access writing. These are not the typical questions that you might think that we're asking, like, what does their grip look like? That is not one of the questions that I'm asking. I'm asking a little bit more about what they are noticing on this checklist. So go to sherrydaughter.com kind of scroll around there, take a look. But as you're heading off the page and that pop-up comes up, sign up for it, take a, take a download of it and let me know what you think of that checklist. Is it something that is helping you? Is it something that's not helping you? And if it is helping you, join me at my next webinar. They're usually held the second Wednesday of the month, but that doesn't necessarily mean that because if we got a holiday in there or something I have going on, it may switch the weekend. So you got to keep an eye on that events page on my website to find out. This has been the Writing Glitch podcast. I currently am releasing the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. This episode will go live in January. We are recording in November, so there is this time lag, and it's because I've had so many people that have been interested in getting interviews that all of a sudden I have a backlog. So that's why I say currently the second and fourth, because I may have to change this because I'm getting so many people interested in this podcast, which is making my life just jump for joy. And 
that the podcast is hosted on thewritingglitch.com. Remember, you were put here for such a time as this. Thank you so much for being here, Hillary. Before I uh, I hit stop on this recording, I almost forgot to say thank you, thank you, thank you, Hillary, for being here. Is there anything last minute uh, that you want to share? How can people find you? Uh, they can head to my website. Um, I'm not the greatest at keeping our social channels updated, but um, they can head to our website, elliandjojo.co, um, or they can send me an email if they'd like to. All of my information um, is right there on the site. And um, that's the best way to to check us out. And all of her information will also be in the show notes. Again, remember, you were put here for such a time as this. 